having some trouble with their internet today and I offered to take today's class. So I will do that now. And the first thing I'd like you guys to do is without a calculator, could you tell me which one of those three uh, trig ratios is the greatest? Is it the sine of 10, the sine of 45, or the sine of 80? How would you, how would you reason through that without a calculator? I mean, those the, I, half of you guys actually plotted the sine curve on Wednesday. And those of you on Thursday, we just didn't have time. We were, um, we got caught up uh, doing a um, median in the middle uh, poem. And uh, we were spending a little bit more time on solving the triangle than I was planning. So we never got to do the assignment that the other class did. And that was to plot the sine curve. And what we did is we actually plotted it beyond 90 degrees. Uh, but for right now, what I'd like you to think about is how, without a calculator, which one of those sine ratios is greater? The sine of 10 degrees, the sine of 45, or the sine of 80? And uh, I'm gonna prompt you in a certain direction. Imagine that, um, let me get this as big, well, I, you know what, I can just erase those. Uh, I'm going to make this real big. I, I, can you do this on your own without me showing you? I, 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 nobody's looking, so if you make a mistake, you know it's no big deal. I want to. I just want to see. I, I'd like you to get a feel for where your thinking is, where your understanding is with these trig functions. So this is kind of like an ungraded or self-graded quiz right now. Which of those three is biggest? If you don't have any idea where to start, I'll get you started. Imagine we've got ourselves three right triangles and draw, draw each one of those triangles with a 10 degree, a 45, and an 80 degree angle. So uh, a 10 degree angle might, in a right triangle, well, they're all gonna have the right angle to them. There's one right angle. There's a second right angle. And then a third right angle. I'm trying to draw these all reasonably the same size. So at 10 degree angle, I'm going to put this at angle A. I'm going to put A equals 10 degrees. And this angle A is going to be 45 degrees. And then finally, this angle A is going to equal 80 degrees. What would each of those triangles look like? Well, the 10 degree angle is going to have a very small opening. It's going to have something like that. Okay. The 45 degree angle is going to look maybe something like that. And then finally, the 80 degree angle is going to look something like that. Does, that. does that seem reasonable to you guys? Now, when we're talking about the sign, what we're doing is we're comparing the ratio of the opposite. So I'll tell you what, let me, let me draw the opposite for each one of these. The opposite for the 10 degree angle is right there. The opposite for the 45 degree angle is right there. And then finally, the opposite for the 80 degree angle is right there. See that? Because when we're talking about the sine, the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Again, I don't want you looking this up on the calculator. I want you to see if you can reason this through. It's a little bit of the understanding that I'm looking for from you. So the hypotenuse is going to be the side opposite the right angle. It's going to look something like right there for the first triangle. Look out there for the second triangle. And then finally, for that triangle on the right.
There's the third one. Okay. Now, if we were to make a, uh, a fraction, okay, we're going to do the um, opposite overall hypotenuse for each. What I'd like you to do is give me a percentage. What percentage of the hypotenuse is the opposite? Which one has the highest percentage, do you think? Would you agree that the triangle that has the, that is the closest to being the same length as the hypotenuse, the, the triangle whose opposite is the closest to being the hypotenuse? I hope you'll agree it's, it's this one here. This opposite, it's not as big as the hypotenuse, but it's pretty darn close. I don't know if it's, maybe 80%, 90%, let's call it 90%. This might be around 90% of the uh, hypotenuse. What about the, the little one here, the, the 10 degree angle? What percentage of the hypotenuse do you think we have there? Maybe 20% maybe? How about we go with 20%, just as a ballpark? Percent. These aren't, these aren't degrees, right? It should, it should be percentage. And about what percentage of the um, forty, the the, the uh, triangle with a forty-five degree angle? What percentage of the hypotenuse is represented by the opposite? Well, one of the ways you might be able to guess this is if you were to imagine you put the point of your compass right there. And you open the compass up so you can swing an arc through the, the, the bottom of that opposite side and you, you make yourself a little arc. That would be about the distance that you would say, okay, there's, there's the distance that is my opposite. And it looks like my hypotenuse is bigger by a little bit. What would that, what would that percentage be? Does it look like to you? Looks like it's more than 50%. You know, say, 70? Uh, I'm just guessing. I don't, I don't know the answer. Why well, I, I could look it up. This is, it looks like it's about 70%. What I, what I really want from you guys is to get a cause and effect. What's, what's the relationship that as the angle goes up, what's the sign here? This is, this is our conclusion. As angle increases, The sine ratio you can say that the sine ratio increases. And that continues to a point. As long as we're working within a triangle, that 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 relationship is going to be true. Now, those uh, of you that were here, my cohort Bs, you guys didn't have a chance to graph the uh, the um, sine function. So let me hop out of here. I'm going to show you a quick picture of the sine function. Um, this is a software that we have. It's called Grapher, and we have the cosine in, which this is not the cosine graph. So I'm just going to hide it down here. I'm just put it underneath. There. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, I'm going to type in the sine function. Let's see what the sine function looks like. Notice that in my um, x-axis, I go from, our, we're, we're used to working from, with the sine from zero to 90, but notice in the x-axis, I go all the way to 360, 370 degrees, which is well beyond the capacity of our triangle. So what's going on with the sine function? Can we actually break through the right triangle? I'm gonna type in the sine function. And here's the graph of it. That's the sine function. And the part that we graphed, our 10 degree angle, well, our 10 degree angle is about there. If this is, this is 100% right there. Okay. So it looks like our, our 10 degree angle 
I don't know, it looks like that's around 15% of the hypotenuse. Our 45 degree angle, what percentage is that? I think these are each of the, each of the horizontal lines are tenths of a, let's say they're in tenths. So we got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It's about 70% of the hypotenuse. And then at 80 degrees, remember drawing that it was almost the same size as the hypotenuse, but not quite. If you look at it, we were almost at 100%. I would venture to say it was nearing maybe 95%. So our relationship held that as long as the, as the angle increased, the sine function increased. But look what's going on after we break through 90 degrees. There comes a point when the sine value starts to go down. And in fact, there comes a point when it actually becomes negative. And then while it's still negative, the sine function, notice it starts to work its way back, it increases. And it finishes what's called a period. When it, when it returns to its starting point, here's the start. And here's the ending right there. Right there is the, is the finish. It's like running the track. When you, you, start at the, you start at a point on a track and you, you run around the track and you've done a lap. You ended up where you started. This lap of the trig function is called a period. And things in nature behave according to these wavy functions. Uh, it might be the tide, it could be sunshine, it could be temperatures, it could be animal populations. Um, many things are referred to in terms of cycles. Like you could talk about the water cycle. You know, water um, falls from the sky, gets absorbed into the earth, it's uh, sucked up by plants, it's eaten by animals who perspire or the water goes into a river or stream and it evaporates and it ends up back in the atmosphere where it collects into a cloud and it falls into rain and the cycle begins anew, right? Um, that, that is a type of a cycle. Um, the problem with that cycle is that our water is going through different phases. It's hard to measure. But something like temperature and tide and just the population of an animal species, we might see them go through a period of of a cycle, maybe maybe there's more um, uh, rabbits or deer in the spring when they're born, and by the winter, you know, maybe hunting or predators or whatever. Um, there's less of them, but then they come back again in the spring. There's many things in nature exhibit that kind of wave-like behavior. You are listening to my voice. My voice is traveling to you in waves, and those waves are bouncing off of your eardrums and they're creating a vibration which your brain has learned to recognize and give meaning to as, as vocabulary and words and sound. Maybe not in that order, it's sound and then words and vocabulary. But the point is, is that the, these, this phenomenon of wave motion exists everywhere in nature. And this is just, um, so while we, we can look at trigonometry and we can look at the sine function and we can see this little portion right here that as the angle goes up, the sine goes up, we're looking at it through closed glasses. We've got a bit of a tunnel vision because we're only looking at it through the triangle portion of the entire period. In fact, when we break through the triangle, we're gonna see the, the, the entire cycle of the sine wave, all right? So um, let me cut out of that and I'd like to go over to the other function that we've done is the, the cosine function. What do you think is going on with the cosine function as we uh, go from the cosine of 10 to the cosine of 45 to the cosine of 80? Does it follow the same pattern as the sine function? That is, as the angle gets bigger, does the cosine 
ratio get bigger. Take a minute and draw three little triangles and see if you can uh, make a conclusion. I'm gonna do the same. All right, uh, we've got uh, angle A is 10 degrees. And here angle A is gonna be 45 degrees. And then finally, am I rambling too much? I've got 44, in about 10 minutes. And here angle A is 80 degrees. So what would the triangles look like if we had a 10 degree angle? That might be a 10 degree angle. That might have, a, this might be 45 degrees. And then the 80 degree angle is very steep. It looks like that, so an 80 degree angle, right? Now with the cosine, remember that the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. What does that ratio look like with these three triangles? The cosine, here's the adjacent side. Here's the adjacent side. There's the adjacent side. And if I want to compare them against um, the hypotenuse, remember the hypotenuse is always opposite the right angle. There's the first hypotenuse. There's the second. There's the third. Which one of those ratios is the biggest? Let's just try to guess percentages. The cosine of 10 degrees the cosine of 45 degrees, and finally the uh, cosine of 80 degrees. Which one's closest to the hypotenuse? Which one's closest to 100%? Let's do that little compass example. If I were to put the point of my compass at the vertex and I were to swing the arc, you know what, that, that that adjacent side is almost equal to the hypotenuse. So I'm gonna guess that this is around 90%. And the cosine of the 45, if I were to put the point of the compass right there, and if I were to wrap it, set the, set the pencil of the compass at the end of my uh, adjacent side, if I were to swing that arc, looks like it's to about here, which what does that look like to you guys? About 70%? Maybe, give or take. So this is maybe 70%. And then finally, what about uh, if I put the point of my compass at the vertex of an 80 degree angle in the right triangle? I put the end of my pencil part of my compass at the end of the, the side. And if I were to swing the arc, what percentage of the uh, hypotenuse would you say that is? 50? 40, even 30%? Let's just guess it's 30%. Let's make a conjecture about the relationship of angles and the cosine ratio. I submit to you guys that as angle measure goes up, The cosine ratio goes down. Okay. Want to look at that real quick? Let me, uh, let me get my graph back out. This is the sine function. Let's see what happens if we do the cosine. Just going to give you a quick peek at it. Cosine of x. There we go. This. There's the cosine function. Notice the part of the graph we were looking at. We only looked at the triangle portion, which went from 
zero degrees to 90 degrees. And from zero degrees to 90 degrees, the cosine function is falling. In fact, once we get beyond 90 degrees, it's actually going to go negative. And then it's going to turn around and it's going to, it's going to start to increase. And then they're going to reach a point at 270 degrees. I don't even know what, what does a triangle look like with 270 degrees? Well, it's not only increasing, it's also becoming positive. And when we hit 360 degrees, this is the finish line. This right here is our start. 360 degrees is our finish. And that is one full lap around the track. Now in, in trigonometry terms, we don't call that a lap. We would call that, I used the word earlier, starts with P, ends with period. That is one period in cosine function. All right. So I don't have any uh, homework I'm going to be giving to you guys from this. Uh, basically, I wanted to get you guys to have an understanding of the trig function. So I have some comments. I'm going to chat. Why does it go down at a certain point? Hmm. Okay, we got well. We got some things to talk about in class. All right. Um, I'm looking at some of your guys' uh, comments to me. And, um, I didn't notice them until after our my little discussion here. Let me get into a stop share. Just talk to you guys directly. Um, we'll talk about this um, next week in class when we can do. I, I think I think trying to explain it through the uh, the uh, graphs and through the iPad it, it works to an extent, but the uh, um, you guys actually doing it along with me. I think I think the group in in, in cohort A that actually made the sign graph on. Uh, Wednesday, I think you guys were in a better place for today's discussion than the groups group from yesterday because they didn't have a chance to uh, they did not have a chance to um, do the graph of the sign the sign ratio. So anyway, I'm going to close here. Uh, we'll get into more about the why it happens um, next week. I hope uh, I hope I've inspired you, not frustrated you, with ideas about mathematics. Um, Understanding your world is what you guys are. That's the whole purpose of your education. That's why you're here. I mean, if if you're looking just to get a get your diploma so you can get out of the house, you can get a job so you can make a living, and that, that's great. But what's what's the meaning of your life? What, what do you? Why are you here? Is there a greater calling that you have? Uh, how does education fit into that? What do you want to do with your life? Do you have to know sines and cosines in order to be successful? No. But it's something that's a part of a full and rich education. And I, I uh, wish we were in person more often, but um, something to think about. Again, I meant today to inspire you, not to frustrate you, okay? All right, you guys have a great weekend and I'll see you all on Monday or Tuesday. Bye.